Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you so much for joining us. In this segment, we're going to be speaking with Dr. James Whalis, co-director of the Le Bonner Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. And he's joining us here to talk about how sleep deprivation due to stress and anxiety over the current pandemic can trigger an increase in breakthrough seizure frequency, intensity, and length in those who have epilepsy. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. James Whalis. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good to be here with you and good to have a chance to just clarify some things for your listeners. Right, great. Well, um, talk about your, your role there as a co-director at the Le Bonner uh, Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. Where is that located? Yes, yeah, so I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm professor and chief of pediatric neurology there at the University of Tennessee and actually co-director of the Neuroscience Institute, and I direct the Le Bonner Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at Le Bonner Children's Hospital. Explain to our listeners who may not be familiar what epilepsy is, who is affected, and how. Yeah, so epilepsy, for many folks, its simplest way to think of it is an electrical storm in the brain. Our brains, much like computers, are run off of kind of electric circuitry, uh, chemical electric circuitry. And for most of us, we kind of take that for granted that, uh, you know, we have this uh, very lightweight computer sitting on our head that does all these amazing things. Uh, when, when someone has a seizure, what they have is an electric surge or an electric storm, and it spreads out through that their brain. And then the manifestations we see are as that spreads out to their body. So if it involves their whole brain, the seizure that most people think of is the patient will be unresponsive because their kind of whole brain has been shorted out, if you want to think of it that way. And then they will have kind of motor activity or jerking on both sides of their body. Uh, that kind of the typical generalized convulsive seizure that most people think of when they think of someone having epilepsy. Uh, if it involves just part of the brain, they may have, you know, kind of different symptoms depending on the area of the brain uh, involved. Most seizures tend to be brief, which is good. They kind of have the electrical storm. It's over and kind of done with. Uh, but seizures affect a huge number of, of Americans and people throughout the world. For most of us, if you get together and probably have to go back now to last Christmas or holidays, uh, since most of us haven't been together with large numbers of family members in the recent uh, times, uh, but think back to the last time you were, it's about one in 26 Americans that have uh, seizures or epilepsy. So for most of us, if we were together with family for the holidays, it's usually there's a single person in our family that's, that's touched by this disease. Uh, so it's pretty widespread across you know age groups, uh, cultures, and you name it. Under normal circumstances, how difficult is epilepsy to treat and manage, briefly? Yeah, so for most of our patients with epilepsy, we look at you know the, the uh, you know millions of people living with in the U.S. About 70 percent, we say, do well with kind of standard medical therapy, and their seizures are either controlled or you know they have a rare event if they get ill or you know miss a lot of sleep. Um, but that still leaves 30 percent, which is a sizable number probably one million uh, folks in the United States that struggle with ongoing seizures in spite of our best efforts with current treatment. Now, of course, we're currently dealing with a pandemic. I asked, you know, under normal circumstances. Let's talk a bit about how stress, anxiety affects sleep in someone with epilepsy and how that in turn increases some of these manifestations. And so epilepsy, just like other diseases, a person can be on treatment and kind of rocking along and, and doing well. But if you if you kind of stress that system, uh, you can make them more prone to have a seizure. So just like, you know, someone with allergies might be doing well and then spring hits and it's the pollen just skyrockets and, you know, their allergies kind of come apart on them. Uh, so we can see the same thing with folks with epilepsy. It's not necessarily everyone, but one of the stressors, and there are several stressors or triggers that can cause an uptick in their seizures, uh, certainly one of the big ones is lack of sleep. Uh, and as me and you know, I mean, you know, if, if you're under stress at work, uh, you know, if it's the pan current pandemic, if, if you've lost your job, even the current pandemic, if it's one of our uh, patients that are employed, if you're a college kid who was in a dorm and thought you were going to be having a great time and now you're home with your family for months on end, uh, that's stressful. Uh, and that stress can translate into decreased sleep or decreased sleep quality. And that puts our patients at risk for increased seizures. With hospitals being as, as crowded or with people not wanting to go to healthcare facilities for obvious reasons, what do you suggest for people who have epilepsy, who find themselves dealing with this heightened sense of anxiety and stress due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, so I like to use the kind of asthma example. I mean, a lot of folks know someone that has asthma or bad allergies and you know, they for years have had the luxury of having kind of standard treatment, if you will, to keep them doing well. but 
they always had asthma inhalers. So if they got to doing worse, whether it was allergies or they got a cold, that was kind of their, their backup at home, if you will, uh, to hopefully avoid going to the hospital. Now, sometimes it's bad enough you still had to go, but for many of that kind of work, they had a, they had a backup emergency option. We have not had the equivalent of that inhaler in epilepsy, uh, one that was as easy to use until very recently. So the end of last year and the beginning of this year, we had two new products approved uh, that were nasal sprays, a single nose spray. So it's very easy to use. You just hold the device up to the nose. There's a little button the patient can push or their loved one can do it if they can't. It's a nasal mist. It's a teeny amount. Uh, in their nose and very effective at stopping uh, seizures if they either feel one coming on or if they're starting to have one. Uh, so those have been huge and really, I think going forward will be a game changer for our patients and the timing, uh, one could argue, has worked out well because of what's going on nationally with those products to become available. You know, just uh, a few years ago, telehealth, telemedicine was kind of this brand new thing that uh, people were kind of latching on to. There's debate about its effectiveness and, and whatnot. But now it has absolutely exploded uh, with mental health being of uh extreme importance, especially now. Um, how has telehealth impacted um, epilepsy treatment and what do you what do you see going forward? Uh, we've all had a kind of a, a, a quick and steep learning curve for, uh, you know, how to get up to do telehealth quickly. In our practice, for example, we were essentially doing no health before this, and we went from zero to, you know, 1,000-plus telehealth visits, you know, over two weeks. So, uh, you know, we became adept very quickly by a necessity. <laughs> it's a great way to learn Absolutely. things, right? Yeah. So, uh, as well. But clearly, uh, I think we've all realized it has a role. I don't think there are some things we just can't replace with a physician visit. There are sometimes we just have to have a detailed exam of our patient or we need laboratory studies or other testing that we can't do over the phone. But there are clearly things that we can do over the phone. And I think, you know, it's 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 going to sound almost understated, but you really can't put a value on it. A lot of our patients that were kind of stressed with the pandemic, you know, to be able to, to reach out and for us to contact them and just to say, listen, you know, it's critical. You've got to have a routine um, you know, we know your routine has been altered horribly, uh, but you've got to establish one at home. You've got to be eating regularly. You know, if you can get outside and walk, do some kind of exercise, you've got to be getting a good night's sleep just, you know, to give them kind of basic stress strategies. Um, and just to know we're there, we could refill their medicines. We could get them emergency medicines. We could call those in. Uh, so they have rescue it was, was huge just to kind of lower stress, you know, alone just from that. So I think, Going forward, it will still have a, a role for all of us. I think we've, we've appreciated that it can play a critical role, and our, our patients have been incredibly grateful uh, for the ability to have that. Where can our listeners go online and learn some more about uh, epilepsy, sleep deprivation, stress, anxiety, and more there at the uh, University of Tennessee? Yeah, so th there is actually a great resource, and I'll put in a plug for it. It's called uh, it's, uh, epilepsy.com, so it's E-P-I-L, E-P-S-Y dot com. It's probably the largest single online source that's uh, very reliable, very accurate of epilepsy information. But if they go there, the, the front page has a, a, a thing they can click on just to learn about COVID-19 and epilepsy. If they want to know about some of the new rescue medicines we've talked about, you can just you know, type into the search at that site, Rescue Medicines, it'll lead them directly to it. Uh, so it's a great spot. Also, we'll touch on some of the issues we talked about, kind of the effects of stress, sleep deprivation, you know, mood disorders, how all that could, you know, make their epilepsy worse and, and what they can do to help themselves. Dr. Wales, thank you so much for joining us here on Health Professional Radio this morning. Thanks for having me, Neil. This, hopefully this information is helpful to all your listeners. No doubt. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. James Wallace. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.